it is false that people have the right to be wrong about the truth. Do we have a right to be wrong about the truth? Now, we need to understand what it means, this idea of having a right. You know, when we think about from a, just a general standpoint, I have free will. God has made me in such a way that I have free will. And because I have free will, I can believe really whatever I want. Okay? Just from the standpoint of free will. But that's not what we're asking here. Do I, in that sense, I do have a right to believe whatever I want. Because I, but there's consequences to what I believe or don't believe. Now we think about the word right. It's, it could be used as a direction. Go down to the big rock and turn right. Okay, that's the way we gave directions back where I'm from. Or go down to the big oak tree and turn, turn right, whatever. But that's not the way we're talking about it here. Or I, I wish that it was true that I have a right to be wrong about the truth when I'm answering questions on my test back in high school. See, I wish that there was a defense that I have a right to be wrong about the truth when I got the question wrong. So I could go up to my teacher and say, why did you mark that wrong? She says, because it's wrong. And I said, no, it's not, because I have a right to be wrong about the truth. Now, see how foolish that is? We're using the word right in the sense of a moral or legal situation where I have the ability to do or act or have a certain thing. So that's like the, the Bill of Rights, right? We have certain rights under our Constitution, right? Or, or the inalienable rights. See, one's based on morals. We have an inalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That's based on, on the system of morals, and nobody, nobody has the right to deny me my rights. We have a legal right under the Bill of Rights because our, our, our legal system deemed it to be so. Okay, so we have legal and moral rights. But the question is, do I have this entitlement to have my own opinion regarding the truth. Well, the statement in the title is it's false. It's false that people have the right to be wrong about the truth. And, and that is a true statement. That is a true statement. Now, and we're going to talk about it. We're going to, we're going to find out why. You know, I, I like studying philosophy. I'm odd that way. Uh, however, after I study philosophy, I have to have therapy. And uh, so it's kind of a give and take situation. And never study philosophy before breakfast because it ruins your appetite. Uh, so you can tell that I don't study philosophy before any meal <laughs> because I, I always have a good appetite. So philosophy, when we think about philosophy, it is amazing what some people believe. Now, we've had mentioned a couple of times, at least in the last few lessons, uh, some of the amazing conclusions that people have come to regarding the nature of God and the creation of things simply by thinking and reasoning about it. That's the, the, the amazing thing about the way we are created with a mind that's able to reason and come to, to logical conclusions and know the truth. Right? I was in a discussion with somebody one time, and, and I was pressing a point about the truth, and the guy said, well, you just need to have an open mind about this. See, he's one of those that, that think, like uh, Jeff was talking about, that, you know, I can believe one thing, you can believe what you want, and we're both okay, it's all right. So when he told me I need to have an open mind, I said, you know, I believe in having an open mind just like I believe having an open window, but I want a screen on that window to keep the bugs out. <laughs> and I want a screen on my mind to keep the bugs out, right? We need to be open-minded when we're searching for the truth, and when we find that truth, we need to close our mind around it and accept it and live by it. 
But here we have, we have ancient philosophers, and it's amazing. When we, we think about truth, they're always trying to figure out what truth is. And, and truth, really, on the most basic level, is whatever conforms to reality. So now we've got to figure out what reality, what's real. And so some philosophers in, in the long ago would say, well, you know, things that we think are real are just illusions. Take motion, for instance. Motion is just an illusion. Somebody really believes this. And by the way, Zeno, the philosopher, way back before Plato. I mean, he's an ancient philosopher. And I was reading a quote from a current philosopher talking about how Zeno really had it right. So just because these ideas are ancient doesn't mean that they're not still with us and those people aren't still influencing the minds of people today. So Zeno comes along and says to a group of people, well, you know, here we have motion. Motion is just an illusion because if I'm going to go from point A to point B, I have to at least go halfway first before I get to the end of my journey, right? But since there's an infinite number of points between point A and point B, I can never get to that halfway point. Because I, before I get to halfway, I've got to get a quarter of the way. Before I get a quarter of the way, I have to go an eighth of the way, and a sixteenth, and a thirty-second, and a sixty-fourth, and a hundred twenty-eighth. And there's just no way that I can even make the first step of the journey. So it's just all an illusion. Zeno, I have one question. How did you get there to make that statement? See, even though Zeno says that, that motion is an illusion, he still gets where he's going every day. You see, his view of motion doesn't correspond to reality because the reality of it is we go places and we get there. And in order to go places and get there, we have to have the ability to move. And then there are those people that deny, like, you know, we have people swim the, 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 that river down there that's got the wall by it, or is going to have a wall by it. They swim that river, and they come to the United States illegally. Well, some people would say that if that fella from Mexico swims over to the United States and he's found out and deported, that he can't swim that same river twice. He can't. They're evidently going to have to figure out a new way to get here. We don't need a wall because you can't swim the same river twice. Because when you get back to the river, that river's changed. It's not the same river it was before. It's got different water in it. It's been, there's erosion that's taken place. There may be new vegetation. Now that sounds pretty silly, right? And it is. But then somebody comes along after this knucklehead and says, you know, I think you're wrong about that. And we say, amen, he's wrong. And then, but we should have listened to the rest of it. He's saying, it's not that we can't step into the same river twice. We can't even step into the same river once. Because by the time you pick your foot up and you get it in the water, it's a different river. How do these people get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> that view doesn't correspond to reality. And then you come to Einstein. Everybody thinks he's a pretty smart guy, right? Do you realize his theory of relativity says that time is, is just the passage of time is an illusion? See, he, he says if, if we look at a river, like time is a river, and we're standing on the banks of the river, and we look upstream, and we see a, a little stick floating on the river, and it's drifting down to us. That's the future. Okay? And then when it gets up even with this, that's the present. Right? Here's that moment of time. It's in the future. It's coming to us. And by the way, don't ask them to define how long a moment of time is. All right? It, it, how long is the present? 
How long is it? See, by the time you start talking about the present, it's already gone. It's the past. So how can you talk about it? So here's that, here's that moment in time. It's in the future. It's coming up to us. Then it changes. Same moment. It changes to the present for however long that moment is. And then it swiftly passes and becomes the past. So now we have a violation of the law of what? What's the violation of? Can't be the th same thing in three different ways. Right? See? Here we have the, it's, it's the future. Same moment of time. It's the future. It's the present. And it's the past. And that's contradiction. It can't be all three at the same time. But yet we're all talking about the same moment. But again, the people that believe that time is just an illusion, if you look at, if you look at poor Einstein, he, he lived long enough for his hair to grow down to his shoulders and be fuzzy. And he learned, he, he grew old enough for his hair to turn white, right? Even though he denied the reality of time, he still had to live in it, and it still affected him. That's the reality of it. Now see that, and these people are still being studied and quoted and, and, and followed today. And you wonder why we have to have lectureships about philosophy. I mean, we've, we, in just a few minutes, we've seen how people deny the reality of time. They deny the reality of motion, the, 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 the idea of definition. We can't define a river. We can't know that, that that's the, the real Grandy River down there because it's always changing. Right? So philosophy whether we study it or not, it's going to affect us in our everyday life. We're going to run across some people that have these ideas, whether we're trying to study with them to convert them to Christ, or whether they may already be a member of the Lord's church, and they have these crazy ideas, and then they're trying to merge these philosophical ideas with the Bible. And, you know, this isn't anything new. In Acts chapter 17, we have three different attitudes toward truth. In Thessalonica, Paul goes and preaches in Thessalonica. And they're outraged. He converts a few. But the unbelieving Jews are outraged. And they say, you know, these people that have turned the world upside down, they've come here also. See, Paul was teaching something new, a truth that was new to them and they didn't want to hear it and then toward the end of the chapter we have the Athenians and all they wanted to hear was what well they wanted to hear something new that's verse 21 Athenians and they quoted when I quoted the uh, the Athenians and they, that Paul was come here that the ones that turned the world upside down that's verse 6 but right in the middle of these two extremes, the people that don't want to hear anything new, and then the ones that only that's all they want to hear, well, you have the Bereans, the noble Bereans, in verse 11. These were more noble than those at Thessalonica in that they received the word with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. See, they were eager to learn. They were after the truth. And they verify what they had been taught to make sure it was the truth. That's the way we need to approach life every day. You know, the law of rationality, we've had a lot of talk, and I'm not going to go back over it, about the laws of thought. But the law of rationality, this is whether you're rational or not, whether you're sane or not, is that we ought to support our beliefs by adequate evidence. Yeah. If we're talking philosophically, it will be put like this, that, that what is real is verified true belief. It's just another way of saying that we support our beliefs with adequate evidence. 
We need to determine. How do we determine the truth? To determine is to decide or conclude that something is true. But determine can also carry with it the, the logical meaning of limiting an idea by adding differentiating characteristics. In other words, we should understand that there are boundaries around what should be considered the truth. Rather than just going out and accepting everything that everybody says is truth, we need to verify it. 1 John 4 and verse 1. Try the spirits, whether they're of God, because there are many false prophets going out into the land. We are not to be gullible. So what is true? What is true? We may well understand, or be interested rather, in only hearing the truth, and that's the way we ought to be. But then we need to, under, we need to ask the question, how do I know and understand the truth? How do I know what is true? Well, not only do we need to know the truth, but we also need to be aware that there are limits to the truth. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute, as we've already mentioned. Now, determining the truth requires determining some fundamental things about the truth. And this is by the very nature of what truth is. Well, truth, as we've already mentioned, is rooted in reality. If we're going to know that something is true, then we need to know what is real. There's no sense in talking about the truth about something unless we are determining that it is grounded in reality. For example, in discussing morality, some atheists have argued that moral values are illusory. In other words, it's just an illusion. It's, it's a phantom, a, fa a figment of our imagination. We just made it up. It's not, they're saying it's not real. They argue that morals have evolved merely to help us survive, but they are not actual or objective. Now, this view makes any discussion of truth regarding value meaningless. Michael Roos, he's a well-known atheistic philosopher. He, regarding morals, he said, considered as a rationally justified set of claims about an objective something, it, it in other words, ethics, is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they're referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, to a Darwinian, in other words, somebody that understands Darwinian philosophy, to a Darwinian evolutionist, it can be seen that such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survive and procreate and has no being beyond and without this. He goes on to say morality is ephemeral product of the evolutionary project, just as are other adaptations. It has no existence or being beyond this, and any deeper meaning is just illusory. Now, if this is true, if evil, from a moral standpoint, is not real, if it's just an illusion, then it cannot be true that evil is bad. How could we ever talk about what's bad if there's nothing that we can say is really evil? Evil could be good. could be whatever we want it to be. Now, if, if we say that evil is bad, then we're really making a nonsensical statement about something that doesn't exist. Think about that. Morals are just an illusion, and if you talk about what's evil, you're really talking about something that doesn't exist, and you're wasting your time. And the same holds for the truth. If it's not real, if truth is not based in reality, then we're wasting our time talking about it, and we get up the, 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 the philosophies and uh, uh, judgments that we talked about earlier. That nonsense. 
That has no basis in reality. Reality is fundamental to understanding and determining truth. When Jesus said, I am the truth, in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he was speaking about what actually is. He was not teaching about him. He was teaching that he is the truth. If his identity is not rooted in who he really is, reality, then teaching that he is the truth makes no sense at all. The fact that Jesus is who he is makes it possible for us to call him the truth. He is who he claimed to be, then if he is who he claimed to be, then we have a means not only of finding the truth, but that truth is going to lead us to Jesus. Now this gives us some insight into the nature of truth that sometimes we overlook and the nature of philosophy. All true philosophy will lead us right back to God. All true philosophy, all truth will lead us right to God. That's what Jesus meant when he said, I am the truth. The second thing, not only is truth based in reality, but truth is objective. Now, we've heard that term, objective, subjective, relativism, and those kind of things. Now, those are the things that you don't want to study before breakfast, right? Those are some of those things. Now, let me put it in, in easy terms. Well, at least this helped me understand it, and I'm pretty simple-minded. Um, no comment. If I'm talking about something is subject, okay, here's, the, here's a, a, a given situation that I'm in. If I'm talking about something is subjective, that means it's within me. I'm the subject. Okay, some people think truth is subjective. Truth is whatever is within me, whatever I believe. I am the standard of truth. Now, that's not to say that uh, if Wayne has a different view of this same situation and his truth is different than mine, then we're both right. That's the nature of subjectivism. Subjectivism is relativism. Truth is relative to the person in that situation. And my view of the situation may be different than Wayne's view, right? And we're both correct. See, that's, that's the opposite of what our title of this lesson teaches. That we do have a right to be wrong about the truth. Well, we don't. We don't have a right. See, that's not reality. That's not reality for Wayne and I to have a different view of the truth on any one given situation. Then there's objective truth. Objective truth is an object outside of us that we can appeal to and say that's the real truth about this situation. See, if it's subjective, I could be wrong. Wayne could be wrong. We could both be wrong. But if truth is objective, it's right all the time, every time. It's right for me and it's right for Wayne. Suppose Wayne and I had a dispute, right? And we wanted to settle the dispute. I believe X and Wayne believes Y. How are we going to figure out which one is right? I'm always going to say I'm right and Wayne's always going to say he's right. And how would you like to go to court and have the, that subjective standard judge your case. See, we have an objective standard in our court system, right? We have the law. And that's what we appeal to to find out whether Wayne or I or, or which one of us is right. Or if either one of us is right. We can appeal to that objective standard outside of us to settle those matters. Otherwise, we're at a stalemate. And we'll never settle the problem. Today, we are fond of arguing that truth is subjective. That's what people want to do. Postmodern philosophy sees truth that is something that we create within ourselves, not something that is objectively true. If truth is real, then it also has to be objective. 
That's, the, that's, that's something as it stands outside ourselves. It is true whether or not I believe it. It's true whether or not I accept it. It's still going to be truth. The truth of the matter doesn't rest with me. I'm not the decider of the truth. That is, it stands outside of us. How we feel about the truth does not change anything. Truth is true whether I like it or not. The objective nature of truth is seen in Paul's message to the Galatians, chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than which uh, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you received, let him be accursed. Notice that the passage, that there is an objective standard to which we can appeal to make sure what we are receiving is the truth. And that's the original message that Paul preached. That's why we contend earnestly for the faith once delivered. Jude 3. We need to contend for it because there are people that hate the truth, that despise the truth, that want to corrupt the truth. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, just prior to this, along about verse 5, Paul says he stands in amazement that the Galatians were so soon removed from the gospel to another gospel. But you know what? Then he says what? But there's not really another gospel. See, he's saying there's the, the nature of the truth. They said there's only one. The gospel is the truth, and there's only one. There's only one gospel, but some would pervert the gospel. If we depart from the truth in any area, if we reject the truth on any subject, and, and in our discussion, especially when it comes to my relationship with God, I have perverted the truth. Perverted the truth. If something runs contrary to what has been revealed, then it's to be accursed. Doesn't matter whether it's an angel or a man or even an apostle, no one has the right to change or pervert the truth. There's consequences. That's why I said at the beginning of the lesson, I have the free will to believe whatever I want, but there's consequences. There's one. Truth is discoverable. How much time do I got? 11 minutes? Awesome. Truth is discoverable. Truth can be investigated, and it can be found. Since truth is objective, and based on what is real, then it is something that we can be that can be searched for, studied, and known. I remember watching the X Files. Everybody remember the X Files a long time ago? In in the office down where the X Files were kept, there's a poster on the wall. What did the poster say? Trivia question. No, nobody? Anybody know? Raise your hand if you know. Come on. Uh, he knows. The truth is out there. The truth is out there. And that's, that's, that, I like that. The truth is out there. Let's go find it. Let's go find the truth. It's discoverable. God made us with minds that can reason, think, discover, and learn. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, God invites the, the, uh, uh, Isaiah's, the, the Israelites, come, let us reason together. God wants them to help them discover the truth about their sinful condition and the, what? Well, the cure. Come, let us reason together. Paul said, therefore, knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. Is that any different? We're trying to lead people to the truth. That's what we're trying to do. Because there's going to be a judgment. And we're going to judge, be judged by the standard of the truth. It's there. It's out there. We can search for it. We can find it. We can know it. You know, one of the greatest statements, I think, in the Bible regarding whether or not we can know is found in, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. Hereby do we know that we know him. Not only can I know, but I can know that I know God. You see that? I can know. I can have certainty. 
I can have confidence in my knowledge. And how do I know that I know him? If I keep his commandments. Isn't that part of walking in the light that we talked about last evening? God made us with minds that are logical, that we can reason. We're not mere robots, but we have been made with the, really the need to know, the need to find out the truth and reason. We have that desire. Some people are, are, are highly educated because they have a desire for the truth. Some people are, are like lifetime students. They never stop learning, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we need to be always learning and, and expanding our knowledge. As gospel preachers, we need to know as much as we can about the Bible. When, when do we stop studying and learning from the Bible? Dub McLeish, uh, he had a birthday recently. Happy birthday, Dub. And uh, I didn't get to say anything to you on Facebook. I missed the opportunity, but I'm going to say something now. The first hundred years is the easiest. Okay? So... Uh, just keep on keeping on. We want you around as long as we can. But you know, Dove's been been around for a long time, right? When did you quit studying God's word, Dove? Yesterday. Yesterday? <laughs> You're gonna take it up again this evening and take it up again today, right? See, see, he's he's not studying. Uh, he's not uh, stop studying rather. He's probably studied longer and more than most of us in here, right? There's never a time when we need to stop reaching for higher learning in the Bible and in life in general. That goes for everybody, not just preachers. You know, Luke, in chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, for as much, he says, as many have taken into hand to set forth in order a declaration of these things which are most surely believed among us. Notice most surely. Notice the certainty there. Even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all things, from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightst know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. We desire the truth, and if we do, then we're going to search for it, and we can find it, we can know it, and we can live by it. Truth is attainable. We understand that there can be truth that is undiscoverable. You ever know about that? There's something. There's some things that are true that I'm never going to know and fully understand. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, Now unto him that is able to do expressly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us, God can do things that we'll never understand. But that doesn't mean that they're not true. Just because I don't fully understand something doesn't mean that it's not true. And the fact that I can't fully understand the truth about everything doesn't mean that I can't understand the truth about anything. All right. Check one of these. Number one, Michael hit on this a little bit. Number one, I know everything. Who wants to check that box? Number two, I don't know anything. Who, I think some people need to check that box. But really, even the, even the people that we would say need to check, they know some things, right? But then, that's the third box. I know some things, right? We can know the truth. It's attainable. Back to our text, John 8, 31 and 32. Then Jesus said to his disciples, they believed on him, or the Jews who believed on him, if you continue... In my word, then you're my disciples. Indeed, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Truth makes us free from sin. Discovering truth will be more valuable than anything else we do in this life, especially truth regarding salvation. Truth is immutable. The nature of objective truth does not change with time. There can be things that are relative, as I think... Uh, Lee Moses talked about my, my personal preferences. I like chocolate ice cream better than I like mint, right? But by the way, 
even though my preferences might differ from Wayne's preferences, where, where Wayne likes all ice cream, it don't matter, right? But, but preferences change from individual to individual, and my preferences may change over time. My taste may change. But that's not to say that there's not a truth out there about how we make those decisions. It's in the it's in the uh, the philosophical study of asceticism, or, or uh, is that the right way? Anyway, the study of beauty. I think I used the wrong word. It's the study of beauty. What? Aesthetics. That's it. asceticism is like abusing yourself. Right? Yeah. That don't that, <laughs> so, that's, 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 that that does abuse you. But but anyway, I'm talking about the study of beauty. There are principles where we can say that's pretty and that's ugly. Right? And, and what I think is pretty and ugly may be my preference, but there are truths by which I make that determination. Okay? So it's not always necessarily an arbitrary decision. There are, there are truths about beauty and, and non-beauty, the principles that I can go by and say, well, that, that painting is, is beautiful. That one's really bad. Right? So there, the, there's, there's studies of all of these things where we can come to a knowledge of the truth, even on things that are matters of, of my own personal preference or judgment. So we're not talking about fashion, foods, or our general preferences here. We're discussing what some people might call true truth. And when we talk about true truth or truth with a capital T, we're talking about things that are universally true and apply to everybody equally in all times and in all places. That's what we're talking about. All truth is based upon an unchanging God. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, God says, For I am the Lord, I change not. God is faithful. He declared, his declared truth will match his nature. For example, when, when God declared his oath to Abraham, it was as if he had already accomplished the, pro, the, the, the promises. That's what we call prolipsis. That's what it's talked about in the Old Testament. When God said to Abraham he was going to do a certain thing, it was spoken of as if God had already done it. How could that be? Well, it's based on God's nature. It's impossible for God to lie, and his purpose never changes. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 5 through 18. Truth, truth is universal. As we said, it's the same for me, it's the same for you, it's the same for everybody. God desires that all men come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 4. So truth is for everybody. Now, truth, and this is the final thing we're going to have to say, is foundational. It's foundational. Truth must be the baseline of our worldview. If that worldview is going to be meaningful, then it must be based on the truth. If what is at the bottom of our worldview is false, then it will not stand as a valuable or viable option by which we ought to live our lives. You know, at the end of the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, He that hears these words and does them, I will liken unto a wise man. See, we need to learn the truth and we need to do the truth. And let that be the foundation upon which we live our life. And again, all truth, all truth leads us right back to God. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your freedom.